Isaiah chapter 9, starting in verse 1. But there was no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he has brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, of them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you. As with the joy at the harvest, as they are all, as they are glad, then they divide their spoils. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulders, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle, tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and the name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the incense of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over this kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of his host will do this. If you would, join with me as we, as we pray. Lord, as I think this morning and think of the song come thou long expected jesus born a child yet born a king lord god i just it's in this time father that we we look forward to your coming son lord as it has been as in prophesied from the prophets of old as we even read here in isaiah lord as as your coming was prophesied all the way into the garden to give us hope lord jesus and Lord, it's this time that we celebrate, but God, we also, we look forward to the second coming, Lord, when you come for us to defeat sin in its finality, Father, Lord, to, to bring us home, to reunite us with you, Lord Jesus. And Lord God, we pray for this morning, we pray for uh, this time as we study uh, your word through the prophet Isaiah, Father. And Lord, I just pray that um, you convict our hearts, Father, Lord, to soften our hearts, to be receptive of your word, Father, that we be slow to speak and quick to hear, Lord Jesus. I pray for Chris this morning as he has, has prepared this sermon, Father. Lord, just pray that you use him as a vessel, Lord, to, um, to boldly proclaim your name. Lord God, we this most holy and precious name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Germany, the Lutheran Church, Our Lady's Church, has dominated the skyline uh, of the city and proudly stood since 1743. The church is the, one of the most beautiful in Germany, and it was uh, consecrated in order in uh, honor of the Virgin Mary. It stands as one of the greatest examples of Protestant sacred architecture. However, during the World War II assault on Dresden, the church fell. Uh, the expli this explicit masterpiece was completely destroyed by a British air raid that also claimed the lives of nearly 35,000 people. In a span of less than 25 minutes, 3,000 bombs were dropped on this area, raining down the night of February 13th and 14th, 1945. The fire caused by the bombs could be seen by 200 miles away, and its temperature reached nearly 1,800 degrees. The church was destroyed. Though peace uh, shortly after was restored throughout Europe, the church remained in ruins, a grim reminder of the power of sin. 
And for nearly 50 years, all who passed by its rubble were reminded of the wickedness of that man's heart is capable of producing. A war so expansive that it raged, ravaged Europe and Asia and took the lives of nearly 60 million people and wounding 25 million more. Though the war was over and the nations of Europe were no longer in conflict, the cities of Europe laid in ruins. Families were forever torn apart, and lives were irrevocably changed. Peace was declared, but peace really wasn't experienced. At least the peace that we celebrate at this Advent season. A peace that only Christ can bring. This morning we begin and we're going back for temporarily back into the book of Isaiah, a place where we weren't before, as we consider the peace that Christ promises, the peace that we consider and that we celebrate and we pray for, a peace that's not simply the absence of conflict, but the presence of our good and faithful and holy God. My big idea this morning is simply this. Is this? No, that's not it. Um, Let me tell you to you. Um, And then it'll pop up more. Genuine peace is the wholeness that is found only in Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Genuine peace is the wholeness that is found only in Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. And I'm going to be doing things a little different. I don't have the, the outline to start. I'm going to bring that in a little bit later. We begin this morning in Isaiah chapter 7. And actually it's on 571 of your pew Bible. Isaiah is the story of Israel's unfaithfulness, God's people's unfaithfulness, contrasted with God's faithfulness. Thank you, Steve, for bringing that up for me. We will look specifically this morning, I didn't have it all read, but chapter 7 through 11, probably from uh, 10,000 feet, we'll look down. uh, Books 7 through 9 of Isaiah are called the Book of Emmanuel. And like Europe in the 1940s, the land of Israel and Judah were in crisis. They were in turmoil. Notice verse 7 of Isaiah. Steve, will you go back to the blank slide in front of those two words? Thank you, sir. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 2. Word came to Ahaz the king. Syria is in league with Ephraim. In other words, the uh, Assyrian, the nation of Syria, and the northern tribes of Israel are conspiring together. And notice how it says, the heart of Ahaz, king of Jerusalem, of Judah, the southern kingdom, and the heart of his people shook. Fear gripped their hearts as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. You can see the imagery of, I can see the imagery of the tree in my backyard during tropical storms and hurricanes, how it it shakes in the wind. Fear gripped the heart of Ahaz and his people, and they had a choice to make. Do I agree to go into alliance with Syria uh, and the northern kingdoms who have conspired together against me, or do I turn to the Assyrians, Nineveh, if you will, the great and mighty kingdom superpower, ruthless superpower of Assyria, and beg for mercy and grovel. And that choice that Ahad made gripped his heart with fear. There was no peace in his hearts or the hearts of his people. And tragically, what Ahaz decided to do is to align himself with the wicked Assyrian king. It's as if the mouse has said, refuse to join the rats but instead turned to the cat to protect him from the rats. And he 
because of this would pay severely. It's not because Ahaz chose the wrong alliance. It's actually because Ahaz actually chose a side at all. Notice in verse 10 of chapter 7, it says, Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. And we know this through the prophet Isaiah. He, the Lord comes to him and says, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol or high as the heaven. God, through his prophet, says, Listen, ask for a sign. Get as grandiose and as big. Think big. Go big or go home, Ahaz, on this sign as a demonstration of what my faithfulness and my trustworthy is, trustworthiness is in the fear of conflict that surrounds you. But notice what Ahaz says. Very piously, very pretentiously, very self-righteously, I will not put the Lord, my God, to the test. Put the Lord to the test. Instead of turning to the God of creation who holds all kingdoms in his hand and turns them as he pleases, what did he do? He turned to the princes and the kings of this world. It's remarkable. What God told Ahab was to request a sign that would demonstrate his trustworthiness, to set his heart at ease and at peace, that I could trust the Lord no matter what's going on around me, no matter how the winds rage. Instead, the king refused. Why did he? It's not because he was pious and faithful. It's because he had already made up his mind that he would turn to the Assyrians for protection. He didn't trust the one true God, and the results were disastrous. The Lord made himself clear through his prophet that Ahaz's refusal to trust the promise of God will actually re, uh, reap a bitter harvest, yet Ahaz chose to ignore the only one who could protect him. And he chose to trust the very thing that would destroy him. Notice the next chapter, chapter 8, verses 5 through 8. The Lord said to me again, this is Isaiah, because this people has refused the waters of Shiloh, uh, Shiloh that flow gently and rejoice over Rezin and the sons of Ramalia. In other words, because Ahaz didn't uh, trust my gentle promises and gloated over the coming destruction of his enemies because he said, ah, the cat is going to get y'all. And the cat got all of them. Because he has done this, the Lord is bringing up against them the waters of the river, mighty and many, the king of Assyria and all his glory, all his uh, glory in battle, if you will, will overflow Jerusalem. It will rise over its channels and go up to its banks and it will sweep away Judah. It will overflow and pass on, reaching even to the neck and its outspread wings will fill the breath of your land. Oh, Emmanuel. See, Judah, because of their king and the people's unfaithfulness, rejected the steady, faithful, day in, day out, trustworthiness of the promises of God and delighted in the destruction of their neighbors. Therefore, God would send a mighty river to flood their lands and wash them away as the Assyrians who they thought they could trust to grant peace to David's city, to God's people, would ultimately destroy their land. Sadly, in our search for peace in this 21st century world, we often aren't much all that different than Israel. When circumstances grow difficult, there is a very real temptation to no longer, uh, to stop trusting the promises of God, but instead, Turn to the things that our eyes can see and that our hands can touch and that our minds can comprehend. When we don't have peace, we seek to find peace or to fabricate peace. We seek to concoct it or coerce it. Think about this. 
We think often that we, as in the church, people, the culture, our world that we live in, that many things will bring us peace, like positive thinking. Let's all just get along. You see the bumper stickers, the coexist bumper stickers that probably you want to you know, ram into the back of their car, which is very unchristian-like, by the way. But um, all, let's all just get along, no matter what. Let's just get along. Then the second one is denial. Nothing can go wrong. There's nothing wrong. It's a very Pollyanna attitude that we have. Or we think power will bring us peace. Peace through strength. You probably thought uh, some uh, Cold War military strategy. Be the biggest kid on the block and nobody's going to mess with you. And if they do, you kick their butt. That's simple as that. What about this? Let's just avoid conflict. There's nothing wrong. No, th think of every time, husbands, you've asked your wife what's wrong, and they say, I'm fine. They're not fine. Uh, uh, and you think about it. Pretend nothing is wrong and just go on. Or isolation. I can't depend on anyone. I think probably one of the best examples I have is this Paul Simon's great song, uh, Simon Gumfrom. I am a rock, I am an island. I touch no one and no one touches me. Friendship causes pain. And so what do we do? We isolate ourselves and we think if it's just me and I put the walls up high, I don't have to feel that and I can have peace. What about uh, contemporary self-esteem? To thine own self be true. Pedicures and pampering, as the theologians from Parks and Rec say, treat yourself. Pamper yourself first. But no matter what we do, these false areas of peace that we seek for, sooner or later, conflict will find us. And that creeping little voice inside our head that says, though you are trying to act like everything is okay, it's not okay. Our hearts shake as the trees of the forest shake before the winds. Whether you want to admit it or not, peace is difficult to find in this world. But what if as we think of peace this Advent season, what if our definition of peace is incorrect? What if our procurement of peace is in vain, like a chasing after the wind, uh, following the kingdoms and the, the promises of the world? Far too often, our definition of peace is less biblical and more like the rubble of Our Lady's Church in Dresden, where li our life is not on fire, but we're definitely not okay. We don't have open conflict in our lives, but internally we're restless and we're unsettled. So what do we do this Advent season, this Advent Sunday as we look at peace? We go into the pages of Scripture to find how God defines peace, how God procures peace, and how God is working in the hearts of his people. There are two words in the New Testament, or two in the scriptures for peace. You have the top word, the, a shalom. You might know that. Often uh, Jewish people will greet one another with shalom, peace. And then the middle, the, the New Testament word, the Greek word is arene which is a reflection of that understanding. And in Scripture, peace, biblically defined, is wholeness, unity, and harmony in all aspects of life. Uh, let me give you some examples. And one uh, really good, which I, I used this morning, is the Bible Project. If you go on the Bible Project Advent videos, and they have this, they do wonderful word studies that are so easy to understand. But let me give you some examples of how peace, shalom, is used in the Old Testament. Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded the people as they were building the temple. As it is written in the book of Moses, an altar of shalom stones upon which no man has wielded an iron tool. Not a broken brick, not a chipped away cracked brick, a whole brick that you have that be a part of the temple. Job, you shall know that your tent is at shalom when you count your flock, all your animals, 
and none is missing. There's wholeness. There's, there's completeness in your flock. You have shalom. Then you have in Exodus 22 laws about how to love your neighbor well. And it says, if a man steals an ox or sheep and kills it or sells it, he shall shalom five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a, uh, four sheep for a sheep. In other words, he will pay back, he will make restitution, he will bring wholeness for what he has robbed of the, uh, his neighbor for. He will bring peace. Then we have in 1 Kings 11, for when Solomon was old, his wives turned his hearts away towards other gods, and his heart was not shalom to the Lord his God, as was the heart of, his David, of David his father. Biblical peace is not the absence of war or conflict, but the recognition that life is complex. Just like a brick wall is composed of many individual bricks that are created uh, and make a whole, life is full of moving parts and relationships that affect one another. And when those parts go awry, you do not have wholeness, you do not have shalom. Think of this. When I was a little boy, my appendix went out. Uh, it ruptured, and I was very sick. My whole body was sick. When you have a bad toothache, the rest of your body feels that, you, that lack of shalom. When you're, you get a kidney stone, so I'm told, you don't have shalom. Um, because your whole body suffers because of an individual thing that's going wrong. And as we look at this, this understanding of wholeness, of, of unity that's here, we realize again that genuine peace, shalom, uh, what the New Testament will call arene, is the wholeness that is found only in Jesus Christ, Isaiah chapter 9, the prince of priest, peace. He's the prince of the priest too. Um, fear the Lord, the first thing. So here's, here's what we do in our seek, uh, as we seek peace. We begin by the fear of the Lord. The essence of God's shalom is the wholeness that is found in trusting God's promises and enjoying his provision. To fear the Lord is to hold him in highest honor with highest respect, with reverence and awe. It's not a cowering under a table in an air raid drill or uh, that, that some of you did in the 60s uh, with the threat of, of the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, but it's a, it's a reverence and a respect. Like somebody respects a firearm because of the power that it has, and they're not silly or careless with that because they recognize the power they have, they hold in their hand. Um, you also fear fire because you respect its consequences and its potential, and you're not careless and, and flippant with that. The fear of the Lord is a deep uh, reverence uh, and awe for God's holiness, his goodness, and his power. As the children explain, because he has authority as a creator of all things. Genuine peace begins when we have reverential fear of God, which trusts his promises over the fleeting promises of this world. Where do I get that? Let's look in Isaiah 8 as we continue through this song of Emmanuel, the story. Notice Isaiah 8, verse 11. For the Lord spoke thus to me. Isaiah, in the, in, surrounded by the people of God, that had been unfaithful and turned their hearts away, Isaiah cries out to the remnant of the faithful, the genuine people of God by faith, and he says, listen, for the, verse 11, for the Lord spoke thus to me with a strong hand upon me and warned me not to walk in the way of this people, those who have following a corrupt selfish, self-glorifying religion, but instead who are following the fear of the Lord. Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracies. And do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, the God of angel armies, him you shall honor as holy. 
Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. Not the king of Syria, not the president of the United States, not any power. The first step to peace is trusting and fearing the Lord. And trusting in his promises in a world of broken promises. Don't try to manipulate the situation in a world that's not the way it's supposed to be. A world that is broken. Don't try to deny the depravity, the full extent that sin has touched every aspect of our lives. Even our most righteous prayers have enough sin in them to send us to hell. John Bunyan said that. Don't get swept up by the hysteria in the church or outside the church. Our culture may be going in the toilet, but our God never is. His kingdom is unshakable, and those who cling to the rock that is clinging to them are safe because they fear the Lord and trust his promises. And they can have joy, and they can have peace, knowing that the world is crazy. But our God is good, and he is strong, and he is working all things together for good for those who fear him. Ocean Park, you will be tempted to be swept away in the conspiracies of this world on Twitter and QAnon, the nonsense that's there, on Fox News and MSNBC, if you are not rooted in God's word and obedient to scripture. You must be diligent and vigilant, or the cultural currents, the waters will sweep you away from Hollywood and Mayberry to conservative and progressive that are contrary to the kingdom of God. If you're not careful, you will be led away from the promises of God and the steadfastness of a kingdom that can never be shaken, just like Ahaz did When Isaiah came to him and said, trust the Lord, not the nations from the north and not the the enemies from from the east. We cannot have peace without faith in the character of God. Look at Adam and Eve. She doubted that God wanted the best for her and she took things into her own hands and the rest is history. You cannot have peace without faith in the character of God. Where do I get that? Look at Isaiah chapter 7. Let's go back. Go back even before uh, God has come to Ahaz, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 9. The final little part, the summation of this this promise of what's going to happen. But he says this, if you are not firm in faith, trusting in the character of God, in believing his promises, you will not be firm at all. In other words, you'll be swept away by the cultural currents that we know and the cultural currents that we don't even realize we're swimming in. We must have trust the promises of God. Then go to chapter 8, verse 14, this continued promises of God. And he will become God rather than the king of Assyria, rather than the king of Syria, rather than the king of Israel, rather than the king of Judah, rather than a president, no matter what coalition we have, no matter our own pedigree, he, the almighty God, maker of heaven and earth, will become a sanctuary to you, a place of peace when the nations are going bananas. And let me tell you, the nations are going bananas. And they have since the beginning. We, when we, unless we root ourselves in the character of a good and holy God, we will not stand. We will be swept away. No matter how hard we try, the brokenness of the world, the bitterness of sin will overwhelm us. With every attempt to manipulate your circumstances, to pretend bad things aren't happening, to live in denial, to live in isolation, or to say, I'm going to do it. I'm going to pull my stru- but myself up on my bootstraps. You will fail because you are not strong enough. But the sanctuary of the holy character of God can save you. Therefore, we trust, we fear the Lord and trust the promises that flow from God's righteous character, knowing that genuine peace is wholeness that's found only in Christ Jesus, the Prince of Peace. We fear the Lord and we wait on the Lord. 2012, 
John Piper tweeted this tweet. Scott quotes it often. He quotes me as saying it, but it's actually John Piper. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, Piper got it. God is always doing 10,000 things in your life. 10,000, that's a big number. You may be aware of three of them. You hear that? God is doing 10,000 things in your life. You may be aware of three of them. The wholeness and the completeness of the God's shalom is not immediate as if it were somehow sprinkled by fairy dust or conjured by the residents of Hogwarts. Shalom is a process of watching and waiting for our good and holy and wise God. Even in the midst of of the gloom outside the sanctuary of his presence. Look at Isaiah chapter 8, verse 14. I think we already did that. That's not the right one. Okay, I'm sorry. Isaiah 8, verse 22. Okay, Isaiah... I think so. I'm going to read this verse to you. It's somewhere in 8, okay? And then we'll get to it, all right? This, uh, sometimes I copy, paste, I type it, update it, and then I forget to change the reference. L- listen, Isaiah 8, it's, it's there. I will wait for the Lord, who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob and I will hope in him. For a period of time, though God's goodness and holiness is still shining, the clouds of providence have obscured the sun and it is dark where I walk in the valley. I cannot see. And then continuing, um, verse 22, it's actually verse 22, and it says, they will look on the earth All the people who have trusted in the kingdoms of the nations, the movements and the hashtags and the own personal ability, they will look on the earth, but behold, all they will see is distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. It is dangerous to trust in the kingdoms of this world and to turn your back on the Holy One of Israel, God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. But let me tell you this, as we watch and wait and wait for the Lord in the sanctuary of his character and his goodness, waiting on the Lord is rarely easy. We rarely know what God is doing, but we have the promises of God that he is bringing shalom in a broken, bitter world. He's working in our lives, and he's promised to bring his shalom to his people and his creation once again. How will he do this? The answer is in our big idea, the Prince of Peace. Notice in Isaiah chapter 2, we, we, we probably, as, as Scott was reading this, you perked up, hey, I know who this is about. The people who walked in darkness, great gloom that, that has enveloped the world because of the dark night of sin. What have they done? The people who have dwelt in the land of deep darkness, they have seen a great light. And on them a light has shone. The light of God's peace has pierced the darkness and it is coming to lead his people into wholeness and completeness. And who is leading them? The Prince of Peace. Out of the darkness, out of the conflict, out of the brokenness, uh, uh, this beam of light burps to light their way. A beam of light that brings direction and clarity. A beam of light that brings joy and gladness. The promises of God that he is working in creation to restore shalom. Revelation 21, to make all things new. A, through a promised, what? Child. Verse 6. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting uh, everlasting Father, Prince of Shalom, of peace. Isaiah promised a king who would come, whose reign would bring shalom without an end. 
in contrast to the wicked kings of Israel and the wicked kings of Judah who did what was right in their eyes and led their people deeper into the darkness. The promise of God is that he is working in creation to restore shalom through a promised child. He has given us his promise, the promise that he would bring his people back into right relationship and that all the wrongs would be made right and wholeness would come and heal that what has been broken. This is the promise we have at Advent. The promise that is fulfilled in Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Turn in your Bibles now to the book of Luke. It's on pay, uh, Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 8. But if you, it's on 857 if you're following in your pew Bibles. If not, you can go to the table of contents in the beginning. Uh, you have Old and New Testament. It's the... Um, the the third book of the New Testament. You can go to that table of contents, find uh, Luke, and then uh, find the page number and turn there. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. In the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone upon them. And they were filled with great fear, like leaves on a tree in the wind. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a child, a son, a savior, who is Christ the Lord. This promise that was given in Isaiah chapter 9 is being fulfilled out in the fields, is being declared in the fields outside of Bethlehem. Bind, you, and this will be a sign you'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was this angel, a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Erene. Shalom. Among those with him with whom he is pleased. See, Ocean Park, the promise of the gospel declares that because of Jesus, we can have peace with God on account of the fact that his holiness is unchallenged and his righteousness is unquestioned. His righteous life, his sacrificial death, his physical resurrection, his um, when he went up into heaven. ascension, thank you, uh, 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 ascension into heaven where he sits at the right hand and is reigning this prince of peace, is restoring shalom, is restoring Irene. And it starts in the heart, in the character of God, and begins with his people. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have been made righteous, brought back into right relationship by trusting the promises of God by faith, we have Irene, Shalom, the, the, the New Testament version of Shalom. We have peace with God. How? Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the Prince of Peace. But now, Paul says it in another place, Ephesians chapter 2, now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far off, the nations that, that lived in turmoil, have been brought near, have been brought into fellowship. How? By the blood of Jesus Christ, for he himself is our peace. See, the work of Christ infuses us with a wholeness and is restoring a wholeness and peace that the world is simply unable to give. The work of Christ has brought peace by reconciling us first to God, bringing us in right relationship, but also working to bring peace in the, the horizontal relationship with our neighbors, the sin that breaks us apart. This is why we sing during the Advent season the joyful words of Charles Wesley. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king, peace on earth and mercy mild. What? God and sinners reconciled. Brought back into right relationship, not uh, across the board, 
But those who have been right, brought, reconciled, made peace by faith in the blood of the Prince of Peace who laid his life down to restore us. This is the good news of the gospel that we have shalom. Because genuine peace is the wholeness that is found only in Christ Jesus, the Prince of Peace. We're called to fear the Lord. We're called to wait on the Lord. As the Old Testament saints waited for him to come, his first advent, we as New Testament saints wait for the coming of his, to him return. And third, we trust the Lord. And I thought about, I have of the Lord and all this stuff. I thought about this. The third point is fight for peace, right? That's pretty good. That's like an oxymoron. You don't fight for peace, right? Or do we? I, I don't know. Let's find out. Good question. I'm glad you asked. A few, I think, months or years ago, I guess, I don't remember, I was sitting with a local elder of a church, not our church, um, not even a church that you know, and he was experiencing some tension with the other elders and one of the pastors in the church, and things were done and words were said that brought friction and strain to their relationship. And he wondered, and he asked me, Chris, should I just walk, quietly walk away uh, for the sake of peace? Because I don't want to cause more conflict. I just want no conflict. And my answer was this. As my answer is in many of the times that we seek in counseling, and I have to remind myself, how does the gospel apply to this situation? And the gospel is not just five minutes at the end of the sermon when you say, hey, come put your trust in Jesus. The gospel, how does the gospel of Jesus Christ Restore shalom in a broken relationship between two believers. Can it? Brothers and sisters, because we have received grace from Christ, the Prince of Peace, we give grace to our brothers and sisters. Because we have been forgiven much, we can forgive the offenses against our brothers and sisters. Because we have been loved self-sacrificially by Christ who laid down his life while we were yet sinners, enemies, rebels, we can love and lay down our lives for our brothers and for our sisters. This is how we have peace with our brothers and sisters, and fight for peace. This is how the gospel reconciles and restores, not by pretending everything is okay, not by cutting people off or building walls to keep them out, not by walking away and letting tensions be unresolved, uh, but we believe the gospel is good enough. The gospel brings us peace with God, and the gospel is able to bring peace with our neighbor, with our friends, with our brothers and sisters. The question is, do you trust the gospel? By trusting the gospel to fill the cracks and restore the damage of sin, that God is building a temple not of a bunch of broken bricks, but bricks that he has reclaimed and is making whole and making beautiful, not because of the potential in the brick. This is a, a figurative brick, uh, but because of the power and the grace and the forgiveness of Christ. The reason we don't have peace in this world is not because Christ's power is weak. It's because often our faith is weak. We don't simply trust the life-giving, peace-infusing power of the gospel to bring us reconciliation and wholeness in relationship between God and the sinner and horizontally between man and neighbor. Ocean Park, you can only know the peace of Christ's presence when you stop relying on the futility of your own strength to avoid conflict and stop pretending everything is okay and start trusting in the gospel that brings peace on earth. And until we do that, conflict will fester and intensify. Like, for example, uh, you know, we act like something happens and then we act like it's okay, and we have this real superficial healing. But that sin is festering, that bitterness is festering inside until something that's completely not connected with the actual sin bursts forward. And it bursts out, and you see the ugliness of pride and sin, and it oozes out. 
For example, it was the Garden of Gethsemane with the disciples who scattered like sheep to avoid the soldiers who had arrested Jesus because they were, and then they went and they lived in fear of the Jews rather than trusting the Prince of Peace. Like Peter, who denied Christ in order to, uh, to avoid the questioned servant, and he wept bitterly because he put more, he feared the servant girl and her companions more than he feared the Prince of Peace. Not until the disciples and followers of Jesus trust the promises of Christ do they experience the peace of Christ. And it's a slow, gradual growth. J.C. Ryle said it this, There is nothing lacking in Christ's part for our conflict. If we only come to him, believe and receive, the chief of sinners has no cause to be afraid. There's the, the song, that we, the hymn that we sing, the... the um, Never mind, I can't remember. If we only look to the one, Riles continues, sorry, uh, to the one true Savior, there is medicine for every trouble of heart, every conflict with our brothers, neighbors, spouses, children, friends, family, your own hearts. Half our doubts and fears arrive from a dim perceptions of the real nature of Christ's gospel. Worship Park, when we pursue Christ and trust the promises of his grace, the loving presence of his spirit moves in our heart to bring us peace. Where there is conflict, Christ brings reconciliation. Where there is damage, Jesus brings healing. Where there is tension, Jesus brings relief. Why? Because genuine peace in our world, and most importantly in our hearts, is wholeness that is found only in Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Unbeliever, maybe some of you don't know Jesus. You know the tension of this world. You know that the lack of conflict is not the presence of peace. Bring your brokenness to Christ. He will make you whole. Bring Christ your weakness and he will bring you, give you strength. Bring Christ the stain of your sin and he will wash you as white as snow. The promise of the gospel is this. Come to me all you were labor and heavy laden and I will give you rest. It is only when we trust Christ can we know the peace that brings wholeness and completeness in a broken world. There is no peace in our hearts. Because there's sin is in our heart. We've rebelled against God. And this is what Jesus says. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And listen, this is not just for somebody who's never put their trust in Jesus or followed Jesus. This is for them the first time and all of us every day. Repent and believe. Because every day we get out of bed, we, re we revert back to self-righteousness and bootstrap theology where we try to pull ourselves up and create peace in our world by our own strength and our own ability and our own foolish wisdom. Repenting is not just admitting you're sinful and feeling bad about it. Oh, I got my hands caught in the cookie jar. But it's a loathing of your sin. It's a, um, um, it's a hating of it. It's a, to uh, relinquish your, your citizenship in the kingdom of this world and, and to, um, to let go of your ability to rule your life because you don't have that right. It's not just, I uh, hate the consequences of my sin that eventually I'm going to go back to. Repenting is a loathe for my sin because it violates God's holiness and righteousness. Therefore, seek to put it to death. Starve it and feed the gospel in your heart. And it starts today. Find somebody at church. Come to me. Come to an elder. Come to somebody that you know and trust and ask them, what does it mean? Because the promises of Jesus for, for the unbeliever is, I will give you rest. Repent and believe. And for the believer in the presence of Christ, it's the presence of Christ working your heart and trusting and waiting and, and fighting for peace. Psalm 81.10 says, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. It is God's heart for sinners and sufferers to give them peace, to give them love. Why? Because the wrath of God has been satisfied. And now we have been redeemed, called daughters and sons, adopted sons and daughters of the king. Every day, believers, you'll be trusted. Tr trust your own strength and not the presence of Christ. Put to death your self-reliance and your self-preservation that causes your heart to fear. Seek the presence of Christ, which restores what sin has broken. Seek the presence of Christ to fill the holes that exist in your heart. Seek the presence of Christ for comfort when you feel the ache of sin in a broken world. Because only genuine peace can be found in wholeness that is given in Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. After nearly 50 years, 
uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, there began a push by the citizens of Dresden and Germany and Europe to begin the re re um, restoration of Our Lady's Church in Dresden. But not with a new, modern, fancy cathedral, but a restoration of the original masterpiece. In 1993, as funds began to roll in across Germany and Europe and the world, uh, they began to excavate the rubble and catalog every piece, broken piece that remained and uh, that had sat in a heap for 50 years as a picture of the depravity of man. Piece by piece, they identified what remained and what needed to be replaced by new ones. In 2005, the construction was complete. Our Lady's Church finally had shalom. What once lay in rubble, the collateral damage of an evil war and the, the respect the, the, because of the consequences of the evil of man's heart stood once again in stunning beauty, a beauty that surpassed that of the original because it stands as a metaphor to the shalom that only faith in Christ can bring. For when you go there, and Linda Benton's been there, and she sees, you see the difference, and I hope you can see this, the darkness of this one section and the lightness, and you can even see the speckles of black stones dispersed throughout the rest of it. For now, when we see Our Lady's Church, you see the black stones of the original building infused with the new stones of recon reconstruction, a tapestry of shalom that stands once again whole and magnificence. Brothers and sisters, as we wait for the second coming of Christ this Advent season, we anticipate a day when Christ shalom will not only rule in our hearts, but in our world, in the new heavens and new earth, a shalom that doesn't come by governments or revolutions, by hashtags or pretending everything is okay. But the shalom of Christ, secured at Calvary, declared victorious at the empty tomb, reigning and ruling in the hearts of his people, will one day come, Christ will come again and bring his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And it will be restored, the creation, as it once was in the garden, and actually even better as Christ will walk with his people. In this Advent season, as we look back to the baby born in Bethlehem, we look forward to that baby coming back to vanquish sin and bring wholeness and restoration because of the goodness and the holiness and righteousness of our good and faithful God. And as we wait, we say, come quickly, Lord Jesus for genuine peace and wholeness is found in Christ alone, the Prince of Peace. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you and we thank you for who you are and what you have done. Father, I pray. I pray that we will not seek peace on, according to the definitions of this world, but we will seek peace in Christ who's restoring and renewing and making all things new because of the blood of the Lamb. And Father, as we sing that the Lamb is worthy, as we remember the Lamb that was broken for us, it is bitter to remember the bitterness of our sin, and it is sweet as we enjoy the grace of our good and faithful God, who is our peace. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.